Thank you for joining us. My name is Siobhan Gray and I'm a barrister at Libertas Chambers. This evening, I will be talking to Dr. Klaus Buschmann, a forensic pathologist and deputy director of the Institute of Legal Medicine at the University Hospital, Schleswig-Holstein in Germany. So clearly he's not based in the United Kingdom, but has given evidence in a number of murder trials at the Old Bailey. He's been working in the field of forensic medicine since 2007 and has performed more than 3,500 forensic autopsies. The first time I used Dr. Bushman proved to be the right decision because he was instrumental, and I see Joanne Millington here as well tonight, um, forensic scientist also involved in the, in the case that we're going to talk about this evening. But Dr. Klaus Bushman was um, instrumental along with Joanne Millington in securing the acquittal of our client, Patrick Paheska, a Polish citizen charged with murder. Why did we go to Germany to find a pathologist when we have them over here in England? And the reason was this, it's um, the case of Patrick Beheska had a, a rather long journey. He had been convicted of murder at the Old Bailey in 2017. And it's a majority 10 to verdict of guilty. And his conviction for murder was overturned in the Court of Appeal in January 2021. Um, there were a number of grounds, um, one which was fresh evidence pathology, and it was at the appeal stage um, that we instructed Dr. Klaus Buschmann, but the Court of Appeal did not overturn the conviction on the basis of the pathology, but on the basis of um, failure to disclose information about a co-defendant, which ironically turned out not to be at front and centre of the retrial. It was the pathology that was front and centre of the retrial in November 2021 and the forensic science blood spatter evidence when Patrick Beheska was unanimously acquitted of murder, manslaughter across the board and was able to go home and be reunited with his family in Poland, having served almost four years of a life sentence in this country. He'd only been in the United Kingdom um, for about three months when he was arrested for murder. He'd come over to start a new life and um, he didn't bargain on seeing the rough end of the criminal justice system. But um, in the, the reason why we instructed Dr. Klaus Buschmann, who's based in Germany, is that we needed at the appeal stage and then of course um, at the retrial, we needed a pathologist who was going to give a, a critical eye um, and there needed to be critical um, assessment um, of the Home Office pathologist and the police and the way in which they conducted um, the case um, when they found the body way back in 2016 and how the investigation progressed at that stage. And the, we have found, I have found that the pathology community is rather small in this country and and we needed to go outside this jurisdiction. And we're very pleased we did because as I say, Dr. Klaus Buschmann was instrumental um, in dealing with the pathology and looking at the pathology um, from the, the, the correct angle um, uh, in the course of the retrial. So I'm going to be asking Dr. Buschmann tonight about his work as a pathologist and also the controversial areas which arise in pathology and um, things that we as lawyers um, need to look at and to look out for in relation to the pathology and how we can help the experts and get reach the right decision and what they need from us. But before I do that, I just want to give a brief summary of the case of Patrick Beheska because it'll inform our discussion tonight and it will provide a backdrop to this conversation. Patrick Beheska, as I said, was convicted of murder in December 2017. He was a Polish citizen and had been living in a flat in North London. In August 2016, he'd been at home in the flat in North London with three other men in a room. So there were four men in a room. One of those four ends up dead. The prosecution said, well, um, 
the attack happened in the flat and the other three men that had been in that room were all guilty and the prosecution was looking to cast the net wide. Now, the prosecution um, wasn't able to identify the principal. Um, they weren't able to identify who held the knife, who stabbed the deceased um, to death. They said that it all happened in the flat. Multiple injuries had occurred, including the fatal wound in the front room. And we got a photograph of the house. Can we just have a look at that, Dr. Bushman, please? Yes. A moment. i just share my screen. And... And I hope you can see it now. Does it work? There we are. Now, this, this case was very interesting from a pathological point of view, because at the first trial, the pathology, the science was all wrong. Um, the theory, which um, permeated all the way through from the start of the investigation, through, through the first trial, where the pathologists, um, nobody challenged, and everyone accepted, all the experts, at the first trial accepted that all the injuries, including the fatal wound, occurred in the flat, in the front room. Now there was no denying, it was all agreed that the attack did start in that front room. Let's have a look at the, the picture of the front room in order to show that in fact the, the attack did start there. We can see some blood on the walls and on the bed. Okay, one moment. Uh, here we go. So as you can see, it's a bed, it's um, got a lot of blood stains and there's blood on the wall. And so that was the front room where all four men had been in that room at various points in the evening. Um, and they'd been together at one point um, during the course of that night. And so the attack started, it was Mr. Paheska's case that the attack started there. He saw the start of the attack and he ran out. So it wasn't instructions led. He didn't know whether the full attack took place there or only part of it. His case was, I only saw the start and I was out of there. He did indeed come back a bit later when nobody else was there, but, but his case was, I just saw the start. I saw um, Mr. G, and that's as far as I can call him, Mr. G. Um, Mr. Beheska said, I saw Mr. G with a knife and he was using it on the deceased. So I ran out. There was another man there called Mr. Shall. Um, he too ran out of the flat. And we know from CCTV evidence on the street that in fact, at various points, all four men ran out, starting with Mr. Paheska and Shal. The deceased was the third man out. And Mr. G, who we said was the killer, was the last man out. Now, Mr. Paheska and Mr. Shal ran out and ran in one direction towards the high street. The deceased ran out. We're talking no more than a minute, less than a minute, when the deceased ran out after the other two. And the deceased ran in an opposite direction. Then Mr. G runs out, that we say is the killer, in the same direction, following the deceased. We know from the CCTV that the deceased heads round the corner, but the CCTV doesn't help us. We don't know whether Mr. G, we know he follows him, but we don't know whether he, from the CCTV, and this is important, goes round the corner. It stops, we can't see any more from the camera. But the important point is, that the deceased, the Crown's case, it all happened in the flat, all, all wounds, including the fatal wound, happened in the flat, and the deceased ran out after his fatal injuries, ran out from that flat along the street, round the corner where he collapsed in another road, Glendale Avenue, round the corner. Now, do we have a picture, um, Dr. Bushman, of just the escape route out of the house and along the street, please? Yes, I will, I will give Thank you, you an example. Now, we're not able to do a continuity of photographs this evening, but you've got an image of the, 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 the house and the window and the steps down. And this is the, the pavement 
um, which the deceased took this pavement along and he turned the corner right at the top of this pavement. And you can see there's very little blood on this pavement. Now, just going back to the front of house, Dr. Bushman, if you just take us back to that first picture, just for, yeah. the, for everybody to, to get an image of this and an understanding of the visuals. Yes. Um, here. This, now, the Crown's case, all injuries happening in the flat, the deceased, their case was that the deceased then gets out of the window, onto that window ledge, balances himself along that window ledge, onto the steps, down the steps, and along the pavement round the corner where he then, they say, collapsed at a front door. So on their case, he'd been fatally wounded. The fatal wound was um, a severed carotid artery, the knife going into, the, into one side of the neck, cutting across the voice box, and severing the carotid artery. So as Dr. Bushman will no doubt tell you, um, the fatal wound, very serious, um, severed artery. So interesting that we have the way in which um, the movement of the deceased, and we have a lot of blood, we have a fair amount of blood um, in the front room, and then hardly any blood on the escape route. And then we have him going round the corner. Now, do we have some photographs, Dr. Bushman, of just round the corner where we see the BMW and the blood under the BMW, please? The BMW, okay. I will just check uh, here. One moment. This is um, just around the corner from that pavement that we've been looking at. And it appears that the deceased um, hid under this BMW car. And um, as we can see that there's blood there. And then he made his way from, so hiding under that car. Then he made his way across the road. And then we'll see there's an alleyway and blood in an alleyway. Shall we see the, the alleyway? Yes, we'll have a, just a look at, so we can, have a look at the path that he took. Okay, one moment. Uh, I hope that's the right one here, one moment. Um, yeah. So this was, we, we saw the, the blood under the BMW and then the deceased makes his way across um, into this alleyway where there's blood. And then we see he, he's come out of the alleyway and then collapses um, at a front door just round the corner. So the Crown's case being, as I said, that all injuries happened in the flat. And then this is the route that he's taken subsequently. Um, now, the Mr. Paheska and Mr. Mr. Shao, the co-defendant, um, were in, running in the opposite direction from this. Two street, two, three streets away in the opposite direction. The, at the first trial, we suggested, we floated the idea that there were, in fact, we can see two crime scenes, one inside the flat and one outside. In particular, a number of crime scenes, blood here, but also where the body was found outside a front door. Do we have a photograph of that, please? Yes. This is where the deceased collapsed. Um, he'd been banging on the door and he collapsed there. You can see there's an, an awful lot of blood. And so again, Crown's case all happened in the flat. So there were three men, the three men who survived were all charged with murder, Mr. G, Mr. Paheska and Mr. Shaw. Mr. Shaw and Mr. Paheska have said, it's Mr. G who's the killer. He was one man, one knife acting on his own and we left. We saw what we saw and out we went. Um, Mr. G put himself forward as a man of good character, whereas the other two had convictions. So we get into the um, situation of a cutthroat, joint enterprise, no 
principle, no one knows who has the knife, prosecution can't say, they cast the net wide, everyone's involved, it's all happened in the front room, cutthroat, convictions, unreliable hearsay, and um, Mr. Beheska and Mr. Shall is convicted. The case was effectively run on character. During that first trial, the lawyers, we didn't have any support from experts, floated the idea that this, that this scene here was, the, was an alternative site of an attack. But that wasn't accepted by um, the experts in 2017. And because um, we, had, we had no uh, support from any experts at that stage, um, it was floated as a possibility and that's as far as it could be taken. The, Mr. Beheska was convicted, Mr. Shaw was convic convicted and the killer who put himself forward as a man of good character, not caught on camera in the same way that the others were, was acquitted. The, it was not acquitted, the um, jury couldn't decide. And so he had to be retried again in the July and the jury couldn't decide then. And then of course the Crown offered no evidence. On behalf of Mr. Beheska, we couldn't rest there. And we, we knew within ourselves that the pathology was effectively wrong. And so we had to go out there and find, and it, it, you think classic expert shopping. Well, thank goodness we expert shop because we found the right experts who, who the truth will out and it certainly did. Because when we came across Dr. Bushman and Professor Crane and Joanne Millington, it became apparent as we had thought and as we had advanced and floated at the first trial, that, the, that all the injuries, that in fact the fatal wound had not occurred inside the flat. And once we were able to establish that the fatal wound had not happened inside the flat, but it happened the, in this area, the area where the alleyway and, the, and where you see this, this front door, that it happened 60 meters away from um, the, the address, it opened everything up. It was, it, it was a dramatic change because it meant this. It meant that um, we were able to put the knife in the hand of Mr. G because he on the CCTV is the one that is seen to follow the deceased whereas the other two are heading in the opposite direction streets away. We were able to pinpoint where Mr. Pesca, where Mr. Shell were at the very time that the fatal wound was caused by Mr. G. Not only that, we were able to demonstrate that this fatal wound happening around the corner demonstrated was a mirror, one man's attack on another outside was a mirror image of what was going on in the flat, one man's attack on another. It also meant that um, once we opened up the two scenes and the, set, the alternative scene of attack, the prosecution could no longer be sure, could not, no longer say that all the injuries happened in the flat and they could only be sure of two of the eight injuries happening in the flat. And they couldn't say where the rest of them could have happened in Glendale Avenue along with the, the fatal wound. But the absolutely critical point was that we could show at the time of the fatal wound, Mr. Beheska was streets away in the opposite direction and it supported his account that he wasn't um, present, that he saw what he saw at the start and he ran and he wasn't there at the critical stage. So it was, it was dramatically different. And, and how, how, how did we get to this point? The frightening issue is that this isn't instructions led because Mr. Beheska didn't know. So we're reliant on the science and, and the pathology to, to, to get it right. The, I mean, that was just a broad picture. And of course, as I say, Mr. Beheska was unanimously acquitted and returned home. So I just want to ask um, Dr. Bushman, picking up on that sort of short summary, I mean, there's plenty more to be said, but on that short sum summary, that, um, what, what were the big lessons to be learned, Dr. Bushman, from the, the, the case of Paheska? Yes, at first, a big hello from Kiel. It's a nice place near the Baltic Sea in Northern Germany. I'm happy to be here in this webinar. And I'm also happy that Ms. Gray uh, contacted me some time ago and presented this interesting case to me. 
when she first asked me, um, it was not about where the fatal wound was inflicted, but it was about the ability to act. She asked me if someone with a stabbed, with a catastrophic neck wound by stab with a, a severe carotid artery would be able to climb out the window, run down the street 60 meters, hide behind a car, cry for help with a severe windpipe and um, collapse in front of a door without leaving traces of blood along the escape route. And I said, the, uh, as we forensic pathologists know that the ability to act differs um, significantly from individual to individual, and it's depending on age, pre-existing illnesses, intoxications, and so on and so on. And I said, uh, well, as a forensic pathologist, you must not say, I can't imagine. This is actually forbidden. But um, I said, I need more information about it. And then Ms. Gray provided me the um, post-mortem, uh, so the, the, the autopsy report, and also the pictures from the crime scene. And um, I, have a, I had a look at it, and I came to the conclusion that given the overall circumstances, the argument in the flat, the escape route, and the blood pattern along the route in the flat and in the place where the disease was found um, cannot be put together with the fatal wound being inflicted inside the flat. Could I just ask you, Dr. Bushman, um, yes. As you know, and it's rare for the pathologist in this country to attend the scene. Yes. What normally happens here is that the pathologist will examine the body at the mortuary and will have a look at photographs, be given um, a summary account of, of what the police have found um, as part of their investigations. And, but rarely, uh, and it's been for some time now, will a pathologist go to the scene and look at the body in situ. What is the position in Germany? Yes, when I um, went into this case, I had to learn many things about the differences between the English and the German system. In Germany, we as forensic pathologists used to go to crime scenes, we are on duty, and the police can call us, the homicide squad can call us once there is a homicide. And we go to the scene, we um, collect all information, uh, we take photos, we look at bloodstain patterns, um, and we look at the body, we estimate the time of death, and so on and so on, depending on the specific case. We also go to scenes where dead bodies were found and the police is not clear what has happened. Is this a homicide or not? We also go to these scenes. So in Germany, forensic pathologists are pretty much used to go to finding scenes. Is it, do you find um, that are we at a disadvantage in that the pathologist in this country, in that pathologists do not attend the scene? Is it, I think so. In what way? I mean, maybe an obvious answer, but in what way are we at a disadvantage about I think so. I have learned that in UK, you have a crime scene manager, which is someone from the police who collects the information from the finding scene. And the, this crime scene manager or even another crime scene manager will attend the autopsy and tell the forensic pathologist at autopsy what the finding situation was. Um, in this case, this was clearly some kind of Chinese whisper or silent post or something because information got lost. I'm pretty sure if the forensic uh, pathologist that did the autopsy and they did a very good autopsy, we would have done it the same way in Germany. There was no loss of quality or something. They did a good autopsy. Let me be very clear on this point. But if they would have attended the finding scene um, and they would have put together the finding scene and the autopsy um, findings, that is the injury pattern, and um, there wouldn't have been the conclusion that all the wounds must have been inflicted inside the flat. This would have no. been possible. Um, no, we know, as we've all heard, that the fatal wound in this particular case, there were other wounds, there were yes. um, slash wounds to the back of the head, to the yes. scalp, which obviously bleed heavily. Um, there were Obviously, the fatal wound was a severed carotid artery to the neck. Yes. Um, and that obviously bleeds. But um, the and there were other injuries, too. But um, 
Can you have a fatal wound that doesn't immediately immobilize the victim? Yes, but not on the neck <laughs> and not on the chest. You can have fatal wounds that will limit the, uh, the, the ability to act very fast, um, but not a severe carotid artery. This is like something like an apoplectic insult, you know, if we speak in medical terms. And um, the deceased with a severe carotid artery wouldn't have been able to climb out the window. I mean, this is also one, one or two meters and um, walk in a rather ordered, ordered manner down, down the streets and he didn't fall, he didn't lose blood. Um, and this would all, uh, I, would have, I would have expected this uh, if he had the severe carotid artery already in the flat. I guess he wouldn't have been able to climb out the window. So and, can, you, can yeah. you just, you can take away the photograph now of the okay. blood and you can then we can see, see a bit more. Yes. <laughs> There you are. Um, so yes, you, you were talking about, about the injury and I suppose, what, what was it about the injury, about the severed carotid artery that indicates to you in your expert opinion that the injury happened around the corner rather than inside the flat? Well, as you can maybe already now derive from the pictures that we showed you, forensic science, uh, forensic medicine is not rocket science, yes? We have an injury that is fatal and that causes a heavy loss of blood, which is death, finally. And we have to look, where do we find this blood? And we find, or we found some blood or could see some blood in the flat. The blood stain pattern in the flat was, in my view, perfectly explained by the cuts to the head, to the back of the head of the deceased, when he was sitting on the bed and had his wall, uh, had his head against the wall. This would fully explain the, the uh, blood pattern in the, in the flat. And we have huge amounts of blood in front of the door where the deceased was found. And when we talk about the injury itself, it was a step through the neck and it hit the carotid artery, but not on the side where the step began, but on the side where the step ended. So there is no arterial pulse synchronously spraying blood out of the out of the um, the the entry wound but there will be uh, blood dropping uh, dropping down and huge amounts of blood dropping down and so, as, so is it the that um the knife goes in one side and then cuts across the voice box yeah. and um severs the other the carotid artery on the other side and so the blood would have to would cut across the throat and yes. have to seep out the, yes. the side of entry. Um, and so the individual would be coughing up blood as well as... Yes, yes. The, the individual would be coughing up, um, out blood. This would have, should have been found along the escape route. Um, also, the windpipe was severed by the step. Witnesses reported that the deceased had cried for help during his escape. This is not possible with a severe windpipe. And um, when we look at the amount of blood aspiration, it was, in my view, rather moderate because the escape should have taken the deceased nearly two minutes. So in two minutes, we breathe approximately maybe 20 or 25 times. If he'd have had the injury in the flat. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And this was, uh, there would be blood going out to the outside, leaving traces. And this and another point would be that he functionally have drowned in his own blood because the blood blood would enter the lungs because he would aspirate it. But what we saw from the autopsy pictures that the amount of blood aspiration there is no scientific grading system. This is a matter of experience. But um, the amount of blood aspiration was rather moderate, indicating that the fatal wound was inflicted very very shortly after he stopped breathing. So the big, the big headline points really um, are that we have um, a police investigation who took the view very quickly that um, it all happened in the flat based on the blood found in the flat. Yes. Um, we, we you, you, or you 
um, were particularly concerned about the fact that um, there was no blood on the escape route. So if you'd have had that sort of injury, you would have expected blood to be on the pavement and on the escape route. Yes, yes. Sorry, I'm just at my service offices and they're closing. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I can continue now for, for um, all of you. Maybe this is one thing that you can from now on ask in every UK courtroom and murder cases, if the, if, if the forensic pathologist inspected the finding scene, because this is a point where information may get lost. And I repeat myself, but I think this is the main take home message. Um, if the colleagues that did the autopsy would have visited the crime scene, we wouldn't have um, this wrong uh, uh, verdict in the, in the first round. Um, can I just ask you, um, so, okay, so we've looked, at, we've looked at the blood and the blood in the flat and the lack of blood outside. And of course the, the, the sort of challenging um, movements that the individual would have had to have carried out if out the window, across the steps, balancing and running along um, 60 metres before collapsing. Yes. So it was the, the blood distribution or lack of it, um, plus the movements, which were really the big signs. Plus the injury pattern, yes. And the injury pattern. Can I just ask you, just moving away from the case itself and just looking generally at pathology, yes. um, we often think of pathologists as dealing with dead bodies, but um, are there circumstances when you as a pathologist um, are called upon to give an opinion in, in relation to a, a, live, a live body? Yes, this is something, at least in Germany, I can only talk about the German situation, but this is something that we regularly do because we, um, in, we are ordered by the police or by the public prosecutor to examine living individuals with, the, with uh, respect to defense injuries, active or passive defense injuries, or just some scratches or whatever we, we may find. And uh, we are asked to put this in a context with the given, um, with the given case. And this I is something that we regularly do. In this case, as far as I know, and I think I had the complete bundle, as, I think so, there were no forensic examination of the three men. There's also a point, it was, not, uh, it, it was not of high importance in this case because this was a special case with the blood pattern and the injury pattern. So you're saying that you, as a pathologist, you would examine the dead body, the deceased, and you would also be called upon to examine the, the suspects at the police station? Yes. I mean, we, we have a forensic medical examiner, not not a pathologist, it, it, but uh, in Germany, it's certainly the case that it's the pathologist who's the same person that's examined the, the deceased that would examine the suspects. Yes, and I think this makes sense because all information is then in one hand. And uh, this is something that we know from other uh, medical disciplines that we have subspecialities and subspecialities and subspecialities and everyone has its own like it's its own uh, his his or her own glasses, and um, maybe the overall view may may get lost. And I think this is what happened here in this case. Now we've had a question in, and it's this um, in relation to the case. So so we we can deal with it now. Yes. Um, which month did the murder happen? Well, it happened in August, so the summer, August two thousand and sixteen. And, does, and this is for you, does temperature, Dr. Bushman, make a difference to how fast blood is lost? Now, I know Joe Millington is in the no. audience as well. But... No, no, no. Okay. Um, so in what circumstances um, would you examine somebody, a live individual? In what, what sort of cases have you, have you done that? Okay, we can maybe... We can maybe um, exemplify the given case here, and we can, uh, or I can say what I guess would have happened in Germany. They would have called me to the scene. I would have inspected the scene. I would have inspected the flat, the escape route, and the finding situation 60 meters away. Then I would have done the autopsy. And then 
as soon as there are arrested people, and uh, I think they were pretty pretty fast arrested after after the after he was found, huh? right? That's right, yeah. Mr. Paheska was yes. But in relation to um, live individuals, do you would you, for example, um, examine people who've um, alleged that they've been raped? And they've been injured. Though, are those also other yes. situations? Yes, uh, there are several situations. Uh, not not only murder cases, but at attempted murder or manslaughter cases, or some some other domestic violence or whatever. These are cases uh, when we regularly examine the victims, and if we go back to to sexual violence, um, of course the genital. Um, examination will be done by gynecologists or ob obstetricians, but the rest of the body and a clinical examination by a forensic pathologist will always consist of the whole of the body, not only of the arm or the leg or the head or whatever, it, it will always consist of the whole of the body, the, um, and, and that is done by us. That is done by us, and we can have them the overall context. We will have an expert statement, a written expert statement, and saying, um, this injury that we found is a defense injury, so uh, yeah, whatever this uh, may mean in, the, in a certain case. Can I just ask you about controversial areas in pathology now? Mm. Are there, I mean currently, today, um, areas of controversy where distinguished experts such as yourself don't agree on a particular aspect of pathology? What, what is the most controversial area? Well, as I, as I said before, forensic medicine is not rocket science. So things are actually pretty easy. Um, if you ask me where we do not agree from a medical point of view, um, I have to think uh, of, only, of only one case that is the shaken baby syndrome. There is a small controversy between some colleagues and even pediatricians about how to diagnose, what illnesses to exclude, and so on and so on. But when it comes to stabbing or shooting or strangulation, um, it's, I, th I think it's rather uniform, the uh, findings. So there is no uh, big discussion about that. But it, you, it, actually, it, it depends on the in individual case. Let me say this very clear. But um, there is no scientific discussion about findings and drowning or shooting or stabbing or whatever. Um, I know, I know. Do you know why um, shaken baby syndrome is such a controversial area? Why is it that, as I say, distinguished experts find themselves on different sides, have different yeah, this, schools of thought this, about it? Yes, this uh, could, be a, an, could be a lecture of its, its own. Yeah. Yes. I, will, I will try to be short. Um, shaken babies, if they are dead, um, are hard to um, uh, to to see at at, at post-mortem examination, outer examination, because there are mostly no injuries or even uh, slight injuries, if any. And when it comes to autopsy, there is uh, a discussion going on: should there be a CT, a computer tomography prior to autopsy? Some institute can do this; some cannot, depending on the technical facilities that they have. And if it comes to living babies that were shaken, there are some illnesses that have to be excluded from a, a hematologic point of view and so on and so on. And there, yeah, this is, but this is no big thing. Um, I know it's not your, luckily, I know, sorry. These cases are luckily very rare. I, I know that shaken baby syndrome isn't your expertise. You, yeah. you deal with, with, um, with, with trauma in the sense of stabbings and shootings and um, issues like that. Now, can I, can I just ask you this? In relation to stabbings, shootings, even strangulation, um, as lawyers, we, we're not trained scientifically. We don't have a, uh, even a, a basic um, diploma in, in scientific forensic evidence. Um, before we start on our way dealing with murder cases. But what would you say um, in the context of stabbings, in the context of shootings and strangulation, what would you say be the things that we need to 
to keep our eyes open for? What things should we be aware of? And when we find we've got a stabbing or a shooting, or as I say, a strangulation. Okay, when it comes to stabbing, um, and this case that we discussed tonight here made it pretty clear, I guess, it is, no, it is not only the autopsy, and it's not only the question which wound was fatal, um, or how long was the knife, was it, uh, was it in sharp edge, or whatever. This is only one thing, but a step, um, especially with stabbing cases, um, lawyers should provide to forensic pathologists, like in this case, and it went very well, the whole information. The whole information. That is the finding scene, that is um, uh, the autopsy report, this is um, additional examinations like toxicology, where, where uh, different causes of death may arise. We've seen such, such cases too. And what you can do as a lawyer is, and this is maybe another take home message, if you want to instruct a forensic pathologist, provide all the information you have. Yeah, this yeah, is I mean, yeah, it's much more holistic rather than a compartmentalized approach. Yes, yes of course. So it's, so it, I wouldn't have uh, had my opinion in this case if I had been only provided with the auditor report. Yeah? And in relation to, we haven't really discussed it, um, asphyxiation or, or strangulation, yes. what are the big telltale signs and things to look out for there? Okay, when it comes to strangulation, we differentiate between um, hanging and, uh, I don't know the, the English word, atrosseln like with a garrot, oh, sorry. Or with the with the hands compressing the neck with the hands or with the ligature um what most cases have in common that um uh, the deceased will show particular bleedings in the eyelids and in the mucosa of the mouth and in the face of the skin and this is something that should be present in case of strangulation except for a special sort of hanging when there is no contact to the ground, because we have the um, venous vessels that are pretty much on the outside of the neck, and we have the arterial vessels that are pretty much inside in the neck. And if the neck is compressed from the outside to the inside, there will be a certain time when blood comes into the head, but comes not out again, because there is strangulation. So um, the head will congest it, will be congested, and this will cause particular hemorrhages, and this should be present in cases of, of strangulation. Strangulation often occur um, together with sexual violence, sexual homicide. There are often strangulation in this case, in, in, in these cases. And when it comes, uh, this, is, this is only the, I guess that's the only thing that uh, every lawyer should know as, as, far as, I, uh, as far as I'm concerned in this big round. And if it comes to shooting, well, shootings are uh, individual, let me say this. Every shooting is different from the other. And blanket statements are rather hard to make. And um, yeah, you should rely on the, on the distance. Uh, is the a, is a shooting from, the, from a near distance, from a longer distance, whatever, whatsoever. You know it better than me. Every case is different. And blanket statements are also hard to make in cases of shooting. But in this case, and this is a very good case for, for, for learning and, and for and, uh, asking ourselves how could, could we prevent uh, such miscarriages in the future, um, I think um, there must be someone who has the overall overview. Maybe the forensic pathologist, maybe another one. But, uh, you know, if someone does the forensic examination of the living, someone else does the blood pattern, uh, blood stain pattern analysis, and someone else does the forensic autopsy, then, uh, as I said, it's, it's a bit like Chinese whisper, yeah? Information gets lost. And this can turn out to be a big, big problem, like in the case that we talked tonight about. Yes, and um, as you know, that there were three experts, three pathologists um, yes. instructed in the first trial, um, but of course it took, um, yourself, Joanne Millington, and Professor Jack Crane um, to unearth the, the true position, um, even though there were other experts. So um, we have questions. And um, if anyone 
wants to ask a question of Dr. Bushman about any aspect of pathology, then please, we've got, um, you've probably got 10 minutes. I'm in these serviced offices that uh, they're looking to kick me out, but um, I've managed to persuade them to let me stay a bit longer. So um, yes, so please, if anyone wants to ask a question, please do. There is something in the chat, I think. But I can't read it. Moment. Yes, we've got one here. Um, hold on a second. I'm just opening it up. Um, okay, the question is, as the fatal wound was inflicted... <laughs> occurred on the upper side at the original scene. Oh, so I've only got part of the question. Okay, any more questions? I've only got half a question. Any more questions from anybody? Uh, can I ask? Sorry, oh, my best. name is Sam Ratsen Gupta. Yes. Um, I'm a forensic psychiatrist and uh, yes. barrister. Um, uh, my question is, was the pathologist, uh, the expert, given this question at the time, can a victim with severed windpipe shout for help at the time? Was this question asked of the expert? Thanks. You mean, you mean the first expert? The original experts? Yes. I don't know, maybe Miss Gray will know. Yes, they were all looked, the, the first question that they were asked was whether or not they, the photographs which showed the scene at the top, the road, Glendale Avenue, where you saw the blood under the BMW and the blood in the alleyway, whether that could have been the scene of another attack, yeah, the, where the fatal wound took place. That was the first question they were asked whether or not somebody who had been fatally wounded could have jumped out the window and balanced on the ledge. And, and we, they were also played the 999 transcript where the man, it was the man who owned the home, which is where you see the blood, all the blood, which is where the deceased was found. And he said he could hear somebody shouting in a foreign in a foreign language, he said, I could hear shouting coming from the alleyway in a foreign language. Um, and well, yes, indeed, was would somebody have been able to do that? Now, originally, and it was only um, at the 11th hour that the experts changed their mind, but originally um, it was believed that, that, the, that the individual could still shout. That's right. But it was only um, when... Dr. Bushman, Professor Crane, and the other experts got together in the joint expert meeting just before the trial started that um, things changed, that the prosecution experts um, changed their minds and started to come towards the defense line of thinking, um, which, which really um, didn't happen until, until the trial process itself. So there, the original experts, had all the material, they had the photographs, they had the autopsy, they had the CCTV, they had the photographs of the blood. Um, so, it, it, and, and, and in fact, um, my predecessor who had the case originally, you know, did ask the question, um, was this, um, could this, was this killing, could this killing have happened by one man? And so, the, so the, that general question was asked. Thank you. I see we have some written um, questions in the chat. Maybe Siobhan, you can read them to the audience and we'll try to answer. Yes, I will. I just want to pick up on one thing, which is quite an interesting point on that. Ironically, because um, we floated, the lawyers, us lay people floated this point at the first trial, but could that site have been the scene of another attack? the fatal wound, because we'd raised that at the first trial, when we came to produce what we said was our fresh evidence from our pathologist at the appeal, we were told, well, you raised, you've already raised this as an issue, Miss Gray, you floated this, this is something that you've already, so it's not fresh, your experts don't come here fresh. So even though I raised it myself, without, and without any expert support, we were, we were prevented from running the fresh evidence point in the court of appeal, 
um, because it had been floated. And so it's, I mean, again, that's a, a, an argument for an, a, another time in a seminar on its own, the, the appellate proceedings. But anyway, yes, we have a further question. Do, do you want to speak? Um, we've got um, Ahmed, oversee expert to undertake a site visit. Uh -huh, there, there are some questions already answered in the chat. I see. Yes, uh, basically, um, uh, Dr. Glass, I was wondering, would the legal aid agency pay for an expert to fly to this country to undertake a site visit, which obviously appears to be very crucial in, in uh, the, the way you approach this case? Um, I think this is a question that should be asked to Ms. Gray, because uh, thank Corona, um, there was no possibility to fly to England and to visit the site. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I think it would also be useless or would have been useless to visit the site uh, four years after the incident. Right. Because, uh, because I had video material from the Metropolitan Police that uh, went uh, the escape route and they stopped the time and uh, with Google Earth and so on, I, I had a pretty good imagination of the geographical situation. Yes. But if they pay me, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, it's something that we will inquire because obviously we need to move swiftly in this country when instructing pathologists. And um, so it's useful to bear in mind whether we can uh, persuade the legal aid agency to, to pay uh, say somebody like yourself to use your services. Yes. I'll bear that in mind. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have a question for Dr. Balshman, please. Um, my name's Hayley Scott, and I'm a former forensic practitioner from the Met Police. Yes. Um, and also a social lecturer at Box New University. But my question for you is, you mentioned how um, in Germany, you would um, examine the murder, you'd attend the murder scene, and then you would also attend the custody suite and um, examine the suspects related to that same case. Yes. Other than wearing different protective clothing, are there any other efforts that are made to avoid cross contamination? Um, yes. When we go to the scene, we uh, wear protective clothes for sure, and we uh, throw them away after the scene after the scene work is finished, and then we go to custody and wear another protective clothes, this is for sure. But we, in, in Germany, we are not responsible for collecting evidence like DNA or, or fibers or something. This is something that is done by the police. So when we come and we examine the body or we examine the suspects, the, um, the chance for contamination is actually not more present because um, Spurensicherung, uh, trace, trace, uh, secure, no, what's the word? The, um, you know, all the DNA and fibers and so on have been secured before. Maybe this answers your question. That does. Thank you very much. And thank you for a fascinating um, seminar. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we've got three minutes left. Can I ask? Can you hear me? Richard, yes. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Bushman. Hi. I just wondered if you could answer this question. Maybe you can't. But, but how could three very well qualified pathologists have failed to work out where the fatal stab wound occurred? Uh, mm -hmm. And what confidence can we have for the future that that couldn't happen again, if let any? Me, let me be polite and let me answer your question by maybe they were not asked. And if they were they, asked, they were really, asked. again, I don't want to put words into your mouth, really it's almost unforgivable that they didn't answer correctly. Yes, because um, I think that they did the autopsy in a very professional and good manner, but they did not take into account the finding situation. And this is um, due to the fact, at least in my mind, that they were not at the scene. Okay, I could derive it from the photos that I was provided with. Um, I would not say, uh, at least in public, that they did a bad job. 
they, they did a good job, they did a good autopsy, but they didn't have the overall view, the overall overview. And uh, if, if you ask me what we can learn, um, there must be someone in the best case of forensic pathologist when it comes to murder case that has every information collected by himself to make sure that nothing gets lost. Yes, because... thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, um, I think we, we're now, it's 1829. So maybe one final question from anybody. Okay, no more? Oh, thank you very much. Well, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Yes, also thank, thank you, you Dr. Bushman from Germany. Thank you for interest. And let me say this maybe as, one, uh, as my last word, for me as a German forensic pathologist, it was a marvelous experience uh, to appear in a UK court because it's a totally different system with the juries, and, and the Bible and, and everything. We don't have this in Germany. This was a, 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 a real uh, impressive experience. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, in us Dr. Bushman. And thank you for all your help in the case. Thank you. <laughs>